Hey folks, it's Nick with Bootstrap Farmer. I am sure you liked that series with Drew Dimbler at the Big Tex Urban Farms. He had a lot to say. I wanted to conclude it with some of the Q and A's that I had originally was just going to ask him, but I thought it'd be better just more uh, interview style given our history. So <laughs> thanks dude for your time. Uh, today. I love it. I'm kind of disappointed though, man. Uh, there's no crickets in here today. There's no crickets. So, there's no mess. We haven't really yeah, had yeah. any troubles. It's, I don't know. We'll see. One of the things that has been interesting about us on a professional level, not the shenanigans we usually get into, but <laughs> is when the state fair happens, there's hundreds of thousands of people yeah. roll through here in a 30 day period. I've got a chance to come witness some of that, work behind the scenes with you. Uh, both getting ready and tearing down and then working with answering some of the questions and that's always interesting from <laughs> not the farmer perspective but just how people view farming and, oh, yeah. and what actually they're even looking at in here and we've seen things like people like to grab a tomato and just eat it off the vine so let's talk a little bit about i would love to hear some of the things because i know it happens over and over again that farmers need to hear that you get asked about about this operation. Hmm. Okay. That's a that's a very good question. And um, I don't like prepping you for any of this. I like just throwing you curveballs. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Keep them keep them coming. So, um, hmm. Where do we start? So I think thinking about crop choice is a big deal. I mean, people come in here and they see anything and everything growing. And one of the things that I keep reiterating is that we we do everything wrong in here. Of course. Uh, and we do it on purpose. You know. So one of the things that I, I want to tell people is try your, your best bet is probably going to be to try to find like one or two items that you can grow and focus on those. If you want to be a vine crop grower, great, you know, grow the best cucumbers in Texas. It's very difficult to manage all of this that we have going on, especially as you scale. Um, so I would highly recommend starting with one thing and doing it well. You can always expand. You can branch out. I know you grew multiple crop types. You right. did leafy greens and vines. You're one of the few people I know who, who did it well. Thank you. Um, other things, think about your space um, and ways to utilize it because that's your money. You know, your footprint, your grow footprint is your money. So like we talked about with the, with the Franken system over here, be innovative. Think about racking systems to start your transplants or your microgreens. You know, any any of those little space efficiencies are, are very good. And then also, and I almost hate saying this, but it's critical. We want to get to the point where we're doing the least amount possible, right? Whether it's from a labor standpoint and especially from a money standpoint. So try to do, I know this sounds funny, but let's find the minimum amount of fertilizer that we need. Let's find the minimum amount of pH down that we need to use. Right. Uh, steadily working backwards, right? How how short can we run those grow lights if we need grow lights and still keep up crop quality? So those are the kinds of things we need to be thinking. How quick can we turn? What turns fast? That's one thing that's so great about microgreens or the leafy greens in general is that, man, you can turn them quickly. One of the misconceptions that we've seen a couple of times, a couple <laughs> of times stick out in particular is people walk in here it's a little different than what they imagine a garden to be, or even like a field of wheat yes. per se. And so they walk in and they're like, well, are all these GMOs? Because of course the GMOs, they've, they've been hit over the head that this thing is bad. There's no GMO crops here. None of the crops that you grow even have a GMO option. That's and accurate. so it seems like that's a constant battle with you guys, having to constantly answer that and fight that series of news articles that came out over the last few years that really make your life a little harder to some degree because you're having to fight all these misconceptions. Yeah, there's a, there is. I mean, that's, and that's the way to say it. That's the exact way to say it. I mean, there are a lot of misconceptions. Well, there's about... other ways to say it, but that's private. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most tactical way. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I, I don't think people realize like it would be very difficult for even for you and I as, as commercial growers, it is not even easy to get GMO seed, you know? Uh, they're not interested in our business. They want those big wheat fields, you know? That's what they're after, not, not mom and pop type small farmer. So that is, that's definitely one of the big misconceptions. Um, and the other one is, and you're gonna love this, the whole, is it organic thing? Right. 
you know. Uh, and I always tell people I'm up front, no, we're not organic. I like to think that we're even better than organic because my nutrients and nitrates and everything, they stay right in this building. They don't leave. Our original pond, we've had that since 2017. I think I've had to drain it one time. One time, water left that pond. That was it. And that was to fix, you know, something structurally. You know, our nutrition stays right here. If you follow proper IPM, you don't have to use pesticides right, or any of that stuff. So it's as good as it's going to get. We're hyper local. You know, we deliver product within a two mile radius. We're right smack in the middle of a food desert. And because of the techniques and the technology that we're using, we're able to get food to people quickly, very little waste. I liken it to people have been trained to ask the wrong questions yeah, and to not take everything into consideration, especially if they roll up here <coughs> asking these questions after they just had a corn dog or eating a bag of Cheetos. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> you have you have people worried about things in an environment like this yeah. when they're not even checking themselves at their house. Exactly. Exactly. Which is really funny. What yeah. else can you say about that, right? What do you say? Yeah. So <clears throat> to further... Tighten that down. We we talked a little bit, or you talked about in one of your segments that yes, you can grow anything. If you want to grow pumpkins out of that deep water pond, you certainly could. But okay. why? It doesn't make any sense. It'd be a big mess. It's not the right crop. So if we take a look at microgreens, leafy greens, herbs, specialty cut greens, and then vine crops is the other side of this, which is cucumbers, tomatoes, eggplant, pepper. These are your eight main crops that hydro growers tend to specialize in mm -hmm. because whether it's NFT or Dutch Bucket or DWC, shallow water, those all have multiple applications depending on somebody's budget, what their skill set is, how much space they have, what their market is. And those eight crops make the most sense for a hydroponic grow. Absolutely. <clears throat> so growing radishes, you could probably grow the very best radishes but that's such a commodity crop and that's a field grown. It's best in soil. Yep. And one of the things that uh, to consider is let's save the soil crops for things that do best in soil and let's make Man. room to produce more of that. Absolutely. I, I remember you saying that in our first interview in 2018, uh, the same day we met. <laughs> <laughs> that That's a fateful day, right? Um, but I remember you making that point and I love that, man. You're right that we don't need we don't need to grow lettuce in soil, you know, and then ship it and then ship it all over the place where we're so vulnerable, you know, for multiple reasons. Um, another thing that no one talks about or, or very little is talked about. Uh, actually, two things. Number one is labor. Um, this is an easier work environment, you know, the way the systems are designed, harvesting and cleaning and everything and packaging even. Um, is very streamlined and it's just it's a little bit easier um, versus a field. You know, um, we don't have to pull weeds in here. Right. You know, we don't have to spray uh, glyphosate all over the place. And the other thing is, man, I mean, again, we are in a filtered light environment. So it's climate controlled. And I like to think at least that I'm at least getting a little bit of protection from the sun rays, you know, right. versus being outside when it's 4,000 degrees. Um, well, the other thing that I see when I walk in here is you have this plane of work in which the NFTs are right yes. at waist level. Exactly. The deep water culture, it's 18 inches off the ground. You're not having to bend down as much. Sure, the tomatoes are growing 12 foot up in the air, but that's not where you're harvesting from. No, you're not. So, you know, uh, once a week, you're going to have to lower and lean those things. Right. It's every week, like yeah. clockwork. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell, right? <laughs> right. But you never as, miss anything. As far as servicing that, that's once a week versus the daily maintenance and the harvesting that's done on the ground. Oh, yeah. At, Cultivating. At I mean, work level. Market gardening and stuff. I mean, yeah. You know, let alone if you're doing fields with tractors and everything and the fossil fuel and blah, blah, blah that goes into all of that. But at the same time, it's not for the faint of heart, right? No. Because you have to crawl Definitely. under systems. You have to come and, like, you, you're going to get wet. There's always going to be a leak. Hydroponics, you're always going to have a leak oh, man, somewhere to deal with. Time. Yeah, this is still growing, no doubt about it. Right. So when people are also coming into the fair that I've noticed, a lot of times they'll, they'll say, well, hydroponics doesn't have a t any taste. It's all watered I did, down. I wanted to talk about that too. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. So it's like, I think there's, because it's grown with water, it's going to be watered down, which is not the case. 
And if they happen to have that, most of the time it's from a store-bought tomato that's been yeah, ethylene fairly. gassed or shipped over. The tomatoes from here, tomatoes from my old place or any place else that you buy local, it's the variety that makes the flavor. It's exactly. not the it's, solution. It's how fresh it is first, yes, that makes a big difference in the variety. Exactly. So if you're growing heirloom or heirloom types uh, and, and you're growing them to, to full quality where you don't have to ship it across to Pennsylvania or whatever, man, I mean, it's going to be amazing, whether it's outdoor grown or indoor. And we've, we've tried those types. We've, we've tried the little cherry type. We've done the Juliet plum types. And trust me, they taste great. I think that some of the, the quality from the greenhouse in certain areas is even better. Well, you, like, can, you can almost control the bricks and the, the amount of sugars that are you, in there. You can't. And that's the thing that I try to stress to people, too, is all the nutrients that they're getting, the minerals that are going into those leaves and into what you're eating, into the product, we're giving it to them. The plant doesn't know the difference if it's in water, if it's in aerated nutrient-rich water, or if it's in soil. All it's doing is uptaking those nutrients. So we're giving them the exact same things that they would get out of the soil. We're just giving it to them in a different different format. And I think as hydro growers, when we defend that, people are like, well, you must be anti-soil. Yeah, no. Yeah. That's I love not what soil, we're saying. It's, I, I love it. I've got a big garden at home. I grow, man, I, I don't even buy onions most of the year. I don't buy onions or potatoes. I grow my own. I got sweet potatoes and I need to harvest soon. Um, yeah, I love soil-based stuff. It, it goes to the example. Either this would have stayed the train exhibit, the model train exhibit. Right. Or it could have transformed into a hydroponic facility that's feeding a million servings since you started Yeah. donating it. So. Is it bad that we're going on concrete and water? Right. Whenever exactly. nothing ever would have grown here? Nothing. Yeah. It's, you get, you gotta. You have to fit you, like we keep saying, we have to fit with what works, you right. know, what works in your situation. So I'm super interested to know, like the focus is the fair, right? The 30 days, that's, that's showtime, but you still have a whole year that you're getting ready for that. And mm -hmm. then things that you're doing throughout the week. I, again, we've told this story on here before, but I think yeah. a lot of people are going to be listening to this in a, in a new light. So what happens here all year long and what's the main focus of yeah, Big that's Tech a, Urban Yeah, man, Farm? that's another big, big question that we get. Yeah, this is year round for A you. lot. Yeah, this is, so we, we do, we, we farm here year round. This is not, we are an exhibit during the 24 day run of the fair, um, but we farm here and in Grozilla. And we even have a soil operation that we that we operate in conjunction with AM AgriLife uh, and Garland, which is all soil. But but no, this is a year round mission. Um, our goal is to put food out uh, that we actually donate. We're working with currently seven different nonprofit groups. Um, you can actually see some of the groups that we've worked with through the years on our banners that are hanging overhead and how much produce we've been able to produce through the years. Um, so we donate all the produce that we grow, and then we use those produce donations to create programming. Um, we've done health and wellness classes. We've helped other groups start gardens of their own. Um, we've done a little bit of everything. We give tours constantly. I mean, constantly. We have school groups come through. We have Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops. We have university students come. We have engineering groups come out and come and check out our technology. Um, anybody and everybody comes through. Other farmers come through all the time. We just had Michael Bell out the other day uh, from Dallas Half Acre. We had you can't get rid of me. You can't get rid of Nick. We we had Bonton Farms out here uh, yesterday, I think it was. Um, so it's nonstop. You know, it's it's kind of, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to be a connecting place and a meeting place too. You know, uh, all of that plays in. Let's wrap this up. It's been a long series. There's a mindset of no matter if it's during the fair or if it's one of our events or one of your events that I'm that I've witnessed before, it, it seems to be the this is a type of farming that attracts a certain mindset yeah. and a certain group of people. It's it's very analytical. It's uh, often very progressive in the uh, social aspect of farming. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of ag tech involved, so it's it brings in. You know, people that are techno, you know, happy on technology yeah. it brings in people that, you know, want to solve some of these social issues. I, I see and we've talked about a hyper focus on something that really takes away from the bigger picture or the bigger mission. And so I, I guess I'm curious to know your thoughts on 
people that come in and they're only about one specific item or one specific type of growing or one specific crop for one very specific reason, can you help people just be a little bit more rounded and a little bit of pump your brakes, learn to grow one thing, trial it out, try a different, see which one you like better, and maybe to find their actual place because there's so many ways to service this industry. There's so many ways to help feed that if you're not a great grower, there's still ways you can help. That's a lot. There's there's a lot packed in there. There's a lot packed in there, but no, that's great. And, and honestly, that that's really what we exist for. Um, so I, I always encourage people, yeah, if you're starting out, this is a great place to come, you right. know, or watch this series. To be able to watch see all videos. of this all in once. Yes. Yeah. To be able to, to come and experience the system. If you're here in Texas, especially if you're in North Texas, come volunteer with us. If you're not, find a farm in your area that is doing the things that you're interested in. I guarantee you they need help. Right. Uh, that's a great initial step. Um, go do it first. Go volunteer for a month. You know, even if you go once a week or something, right? Um, make the time. If it's important to you, make the time. You'll make the time if you if you want to. More importantly, you're learning from people that do it every single day, exactly. And not, hey, I think or I have this idea. It's uh -huh. all on paper. And look, this is where great ideas come from. But it's the the tactical daily things Most that makes this thing last. Definitely. And then there's also we we keep speaking on this and we keep talking about this over and over again, but. Uh, there's also the need to find out what sells in your area. Right. You know, microgreens aren't going to sell or, in listen, rural... Or things to get donated. Ex they, or, yes. There's no point of growing this to donate it if it's not going to get used. Exactly. And I've seen that too. I, I, I know... Won't say any yeah, names right, here. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know some, some stuff where... Some situations where that has happened, um, which is very unfortunate where people are donating and people are like, what do we do with this? You know? Um, or there's not a need for it. So, yeah, addressing a need, I guess, is probably the best way. What niche can you fill? Whether it's commercial uh, for sales or if it's nonprofit for donation, what is needed? And start there. You know, I always say this is the last thing we'll say, but it, yeah, this is the last thing we'll say, right? <laughs> so when I got into hydroponics, for me, it was, it was not romantically motivated. Like I saw a way to add to my business as yes. bottom line. And we built a farm around that. We built a sales mechanism around that. And yeah. so I found that growing was the easiest part of it. Building it wasn't terribly difficult. If you have any background in building whatsoever, just yeah. a willingness to, you know, try it out. But I think there's this idea that I'm going to get this system. It's going to be the end all and be all. Maintenance is going to be little. I'm never going to change it. Like all of that proved to be false everything that we did we expanded on we made our own yeah. we made adjustments and i i think that is probably for me when it comes to hydroponic i'm going to grow in water what kind of water like what are you talking about is it is it going to be dutch bucket is it going to be dwc what kind of crop they're not asking the right questions in the beginning and that's i'm so passionate about that because as as expensive of a venture as this could be and often is yeah. off the bat we need to make sure that there's a market for it. And we need to understand that no matter what we do the first time, it's always going to change. It should be expected. It is. Definitely. Yeah. And that's one thing that I, that I really liked about, uh, about our friends up at Green Bee, you know, is they started small. Where did they start? Like in their basement or something, right? With the small yeah, NFT like, rack system. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we helped them expand with, with your D DWC system uh, greatly you know, into their new building, but they started small and they realized, man, they were capable of selling more, of course. you know? Um, and they had all farm income, which again, we talked about earlier, but you know, when you're initially setting up, especially it's probably a very good idea. Um, right. and just kind of gingerly get into this thing and, and see where it goes. And yeah, like you say, I mean, I know so many growers who, I mean, we, we mentioned bell a minute ago, but he's a classic example. I mean, he's moved totally farmed it, you know, and now he's got chickens and, quail eggs and all this other stuff that i mean i don't think he was even on his mind when he first started and that's very typical so you got to be ready for the twists and turns right and also that is one thing that i love about uh controlled environment ag um is that it can move very quickly so you might find oh man i'm, I'm not selling a lot of romaine lettuce or whatever but man all these chefs want arugula and pak choy 
Well, you can very quickly get into that game. You know, in a month, it's, you know, six weeks, you can have it. And then you can continue to have it. So that is one thing that's very nice about the uh, CEA is that, especially with leafy greens, it can move pretty quick. Right. Well, it's very important that we also shout out the people that, you know, you work with every single day, the administration here at uh, the State Fire of Texas. This is a tremendous thing that is here for the community that's been able to be paid for by a yeah. for-profit business. You know, I mean, well, there exactly. we go. You know, they're they're allowing this to happen because it's it's a great story for them. But it's it's also very important that they're part of this community. But the the people that you do this with every single day, that's part of that staff. They're all wonderful people. I love seeing all of them. And then also shouting out the community that you guys have built Definitely. around this whole thing. It's it's pretty awesome. And it's it's you're the one that's always on camera, but it's it's for sure. A oh yeah, I'm people. I'm definitely not alone in this. And yeah, you, you mentioned it. First, first and foremost, we need to thank the company, the State Fair of Texas, for allowing me to do this and being so supportive through the years. Um, on top of that, we need to thank the fair goers because they're the ones who fund all this. Right. I mean, all of my funding comes from the the revenue that we produce during the state fair of texas we're not even allowed to take outside money so when the fair goers come out and uh get on the ferris wheel they eat the corn dogs play some of the games a portion of that money funds programs like the big Tex urban farms um so we're very thankful to anyone and everyone who can come out and experience the fair um you keep us going and then yes south dallas community uh southern dallas in general beautiful place with a lot of beautiful people um, you hear a lot of negative things and this, that, and the other. We we found, I mean, I've met some of the most amazing people, people like Tyrone, you know, uh, or Charles over there at, uh, at Restorative Farms and, you know, people at the One Eater Craft Rec Center and all these other groups that we're working with all over. T.R. Hoover, a wonderful organization. And then my guys, of course, I've got to, we got to shout out to Jeff and, and, and Rob and Christian, the young up and comer, uh, He's there, and then Ford and Barron too. I know that they're they're not with me anymore, but they were part of building this thing. It's so the foundation, they, they man. get a shout it's out the boys. too. Absolutely. Well, again, thanks for your time. Thanks for oh, all man. your knowledge. It's yeah. Uh, I think it's important to to point out that you are a trained horticulture horticulturalist. You know, it's it's not just practical application. It's that formal training plus years and years of actually years and you know, years man. doing it, seeing it. You've been to other farms a lot. You know, it's, yeah, I, I've done a little bit of everything in the in the quote unquote green industry. You know, I cut my teeth in ornamentals. Uh, that's where I, I learned. I did landscaping for a while, like yourself. It was in the nursery biz and, you know, propagation. And I learned it all, you know. So, so yeah, that, that foundation allowed me to transition into all this different hydroponic stuff. And, and probably is one of the reasons that we're able to keep up with all the different crop types and systems. Well, all, all that leads to my favorite thing about you is just your willingness to share your knowledge and, uh, I mean, not only help us, but in turn, help everybody else just learn a little bit more, more about stuff. it. That's what I'm here for, for Thank sure. You, brother. Thank you. Well, get up. Get up. Get up.